There's been praise uh, this year, but also a great deal of criticism uh, of the government's use of data uh, to tackle the pandemic and many of the problems arising from it. Um, I think few of us will forget the uh, fiasco uh, that we saw this summer over algorithmic decision making to judge exam results uh, and the understandable explosion of anger that, um, that it created because it was so obviously poorly thought through and executed. Uh, but I think this issue of the effective and judicious use of data um, by government is an increasingly vital topic. Um, the plethora of data generated by the way we live uh, now has already you know, transformed the world of business. Um, government's been a little bit slower, uh, but you know, it is being transformed by it in, in much the same way. And I think uh, the debate over how that's going to play out uh, is a very topical one. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, the Telegraph's Elie zolfer uh to introduce our next and final keynote speaker, speaker of the day. Ellie. Today, we're very lucky to have with us Sir Nigel Shadbolt, who is the co-founder of the Open Data Institute and one of the world's leading experts in computer science and AI. Among many other things, Sir Nigel is principal of Jesus College, Oxford, and a professor in computer science at Oxford University. Today, he's going to talk to us about the difference open data can make to our society. Nigel, thank you for taking time to talk to us today. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Ellie, and it's uh, a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, I want to talk today about the difference data can make, and I'll be emphasizing open data, but I think we'll see in the conversation that the, the issues raise across all types of data. So I thought I'd take us back, um, oh, a good amount of time now to the 19th century, where there are two exemplary examples of the use of data, and both of them, in a sense, relating to public health concerns. The first, famously, in, uh, in the slide you can see on the right-hand side, is a picture of John Snow, a physician, and he undertook this extraordinary work in a cholera outbreak in London, around Soho, in fact, where he identified that cholera was a waterborne disease for the first time. That had a huge effect on, um, on, on public health. The data that was collected was beautifully mapped, as you can see in the image there. Each of the black blocks along by the uh, roads and streets there are mortalities, are deaths in a household. And you can see the black blocks that relate to an area very close to what was actually a water pump. That water pump was the source of contagion. That was an insight that came from the data. Similarly, on the left, we see Florence Nightingale, who in her extraordinary work, work in the Crimea, um, came to understand that there was a huge, huge problem the army had in deaths not on the battlefield, but in all sorts of unsanitary and difficult conditions in the field hospitals of the time. She actually produced these wonderful infographics on the left, so-called Coxcomb diagrams that illustrate the extent of death and disease in the hospital. Florence Nightingale showed one of the first examples of infographics, and it's a beautiful example of the power of data. And we can stay with that theme all the way through the 20th century and into the 21st century. And here I want to illustrate, again, the power of open data, data collected at scale by many individuals. This is a map of Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of Haiti, an impoverished and poor nation in of course, the, um, off the coast of the United States. Haiti was too poor to afford detailed mapping of its infrastructure, of its main city, in fact. And this is just about as accurate a map as they had at the time of Port-au-Prince. Just a few days later, weeks later, we had this extraordinary map. How was that produced? What was the change? Well, actually, what happened is on the... 12th of January 2010, a huge earthquake hit the island and Haiti was laid waste and Port-au-Prince was raised to the ground. And at that point, a whole range of first responders went in. And what you're seeing in this animation 
the flashes and images you can see on the map are responders who are using their mobile phones and computers, their laptops, to upload in real time the GPS coordinates as they walk the streets of a ruined capital. They were building a map, crowdsourcing a map with the help of open data that they were collecting and uploading and the use of satellite imagery, which is then being overlaid. And all of this led to this extraordinary product, a high resolution map, which then the first responders could use to plot and place the efforts of the recovery process. And it's a great example, I think, of where data and humans combined together with computer algorithms and data at scale can produce products really quickly. That map was produced in the course of a few weeks. This is a situation we find time and time again, and it's very interesting to note that in many situations, it's public health emergencies or other disasters that are driving force. Here we have an image from the Ebola outbreak in 2014. This terrible outbreak actually res resulted in a very significant amount of deaths. But those deaths were plotted as they occurred by camps by region. Now that allowed responders to get in and see where they actually had to invest their efforts. Interestingly enough, another aspect of the data that was made openly available was the genome sequence of the Ebola virus. That genome sequence quickly made available was one of the reasons that therapeutics could be made available at scale and widely. And that's an enduring lesson for us. Data generated by the scientific community at scale can make a huge difference. It can help us manage our response. It can help us respond in the first place and it can help us come up with solutions to the particular problems we face. And I think the genomics uh, field offers a great example where data made freely and openly available has been transformative. It hasn't destroyed value. It's created all sorts of economic and social value. In the early days, in fact, there were attempts to patent various bits of genomic structure. But through time, the recognition has been that these are fundamental open data results that benefit everyone. So when the human genome, for example, was sequenced and made available, that led to a huge creation of industries that were building innovative products off the back of those insights. And of course, it's been fundamental in our response in public health settings. So these are some of the great examples from history as to what open data can do, particularly in these disaster and health contexts and scenarios. And it was one of the reasons that in 2012, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and myself founded the Open Data Institute, headquartered in London and led by the executive team, including Dr. Jenny Tennyson and Louise Burke. The ODI, the Open Data Institute, is fundamentally all about trying to find the value in open data. And it was partly brought into existence off the back of the experience that UK governments had in opening up their own data. And here's a whole range of apps that were built and developed off the back of open data releases. And Tim Berners-Lee and myself were heavily involved in that effort in from 2009, 10 onwards, we worked with a variety of governments to get the release of data held by government much more widely available. And this involved producing new kinds of licenses, the so-called um, open licenses that are a fundamental part of the open data ecosystem. It involved getting different parts of government, different agencies to release their data as open data. And for example, on this screen, you can see releases that have powered applications, for example, from Transport for London, from the Environmental Agency, from various police forces. All of this data made available produces apps that developers in the private and public sector can develop together. So open data is a huge force for innovation. The vision we have at the Open Data Institute is a world where data works for everyone. And I think we're all aware 
that one of the concerns that many people have is there are real imbalances, real asymmetries between consumers and large companies, between citizens and their governments about who has a stake or who has agency in the data that is often generated by the citizens and consumers in question. We want an ecosystem that works for everyone. So our mission at the ODI, ODI is simply to work with companies and governments to build what we call an open and trustworthy data ecosystem. One of the early things we did at the ODI was respond to the fact that very often people imagine that open data is a particular concern of a particular subgroup of activists. We regard open data as a foundation on which all sorts of other strains and varieties and species of data sits. And this is our so-called open data spectrum diagram. We spend a lot of time talking to companies, talking to politicians, officials, and a whole range of stakeholders about the fact that data comes in many types. And of course, there will be data that is quite reasonably closed. It may be private, sensitive, confidential, have security implications. It needs to be carefully managed and curated. There will be other classes of data which we want to share, but share with particular constraints and particular permissions in mind. And there will be another important class of data whose most useful feature is that it's open for everyone to use. And in fact, our image of this is almost as a pyramid with the open data as a broad basic foundation on which other, sits of other sorts of data can sit. So the issue around the data spectrum is working out who has access to it. Data may be big data, it may be huge gigabytes and terabytes of data. It may be relatively small amounts of data, but is nevertheless essentially important. The list, for example, of legally constituted companies in the UK is open data and isn't a particularly large data file, but it contains within it an extraordinarily rich and important data resource, the register of legally constituted companies. Other data will be terabytes large, the models that drive and the data that drives our climate models and our weather prediction, for example. And some data will be held by government, some in a commercial context, and some of it will be generated by us as individuals. And so these different dimensions to the data spectrum are crucially important to understand as we seek to regulate and exploit the data that we have available. The ODI has put a lot of thought into the way in which we can effectively share data. And just last year, we published a report with Lloyd's Register Foundation, which was essentially a manifesto for sharing, in this case, engineering data. But as a set of principles, we believe it's very, it has very wide utility. And I'd recommend this as a place to go and have a look for the sorts of principles that we're trying to promote and disseminate within the Open Data Institute. Of course, bringing us right up to date, we are facing an extraordinary challenge with the pandemic that we're all having to deal with. A challenge that is going to be fundamentally dealt with by the deployment of effective and timely and accurate data. And right back to the earlier example I gave you of Ebola, just in the same way, we are very concerned to know what the genomic structure of SARS-CoV-2 is. That data was available very early, and uh, it was sequenced very early, and it's been one of the main reasons that we've been able to get into the process of drug development, discovery, and therapeutic uh, development with existing drugs we might have. So we can quite clearly see why that's going to be a desirable and an important thing to promote. The fundamental scientific basis of the virus, no one could contest that that is important to know and share. And again, at the ODI, we've been working hard on how you can use the insights from our open data experience for sharing data in the COVID context guidance and tools around, for example, how the models that are being developed for COVID could be shared, might be shared. 
Now, this actually brings us to some really interesting questions around the provenance and origination of information, models, predictions in this vitally significant area. You'll be aware of the considerable hoo-ha around um, Neil Ferguson's uh, models when he applied his methods from Imperial College, his tools developed within his Imperial College research team to forecast the number of deaths that might arise if nothing was done in the COVID transmission context. And this imagined somewhere in the order of 500,000 deaths if nothing were done. Now that caused great concern. It actually was the reason the government instigated the first lockdown. But there was at that point considerable concern about the basis of the models being used. There was a great deal of discussion of whether the model was actually entirely trustworthy. Was it actually producing the results that the underlying epidemiological insights suggested it should result? Who checked the code? Now, it turned out that after the fact, a great deal of effort was put into refactoring and re-implementing that code. It's available on the GitHub repositories. You can download it, examine it, innovate around it, improve it, see it, run it. And that has been a very important way of building confidence. It turned out, in fact, that his major insights and observations were entirely consistent with the models. The code did run in the way that the models uh, required. And that's been a very important way of building confidence, I think, uh, between those who are infected and impacted by the model and the model originators. Epidemiologists are not about keeping their models close to the chest. It is also about giving them tools and standards to publish this in a way that allows it to be open and available. And that example of sharing our models in the COVID context, that example of getting access to data quickly, which can be incorporated, has been a really striking feature of our response in the pandemic. So here's a few examples. Actually, one of the ones I like most is on the right there. It was uh, work that was done with the BBC. Uh, Hannah Fry led some of this work to try and collect a much larger set of data that relates to the social contacts that we have in the UK, in our daily lives. How many people do we actually meet on average in our daily lives? Are they friends or family, work colleagues? And the assumptions that are made around that are fundamental about the way uh, a model is implemented in epidemiological terms. And it turns out that the actual data being relied on for quite a considerable time was really not very substantial at all. So this was an effort in advance of the actual COVID ap epidemic happening they did this to actually model a potential influenza breakout. And in 2018, they actually had a large scale crowdsourced activity to have people report and log their social contacts. That data was an important input when COVID-19 arrived and has been used by epidemiologists in serious contexts ever since in earnest. Another nice example of the use of data being shared is the telephone data, the log data from the mobile phone companies. This on the left is data from Telefonica, the Spanish um, telco, and they made their data available. Uh, actually, um, they went to a lot of trouble to make sure that the personal data wasn't revealed, so it's anonymized but it allowed them to show the flow of individuals through Spain and its various regions. And it was an important resource in modeling the transmission routes within the Spanish context. And here is some of the uh, very early modeling that was done in Korea, in Seoul. Uh, the contact tracing that was built there used mobile phone telephony data to model contacts that individuals had had with one another. Now, again, this raised a number of interesting issues around privacy, um, but the Korean authorities took the view that the public health emergency gave them license to produce 
models based on this detailed mobile data. And moreover, <clears throat> this data was published. It was published openly. Uh, and again, that produced an interesting conversation among researchers because they had not entirely uh, disidentified or anonymized certain aspects of the data. Um, and was that a public health uh, example where you could change the expectations around what would be reasonable in privacy terms? And here's another example I like from the uh, use of private and public data sets to model economic impact. This is a, an Australian company, SEER, who are actually making their data available uh, in the first instance for a year during the pandemic to analyze the economic consequences of uh, various um, impacts of lockdowns and various other pharma, non-pharmacological interventions in the Australian context. Just what can you know in advance about where the most susceptible households and families might be in terms of economic or social deprivation? Now, some of that data, of course, is held and collected by state authorities, would be available as open data, but they're mixing into that their own commercial data sets and insights. And data deployed in the context of the pandemic isn't just about developing uh, more effective models of where it is, more effective models of contact tracing, more effective therapeutics. It's also about showing where issues might not be addressed. They're about equity, fairness, access. Um, without revealing too much here, this, this, this is a really interesting uh, graphical visualization. It's of a part of a large US urban complex, a city in the US. And what you're seeing here, the um, yellow dots there, are COVID testing sites. And the color coding, each of those pixels there coded is either a pink or a, or a cyan or a gray, uh, represent socio-demographic wealth, essentially um, also quite heavily ethnically oriented. And the interesting thing about that is that the highest density of testing sites uh, in the most affluent parts of the city. And we know that these viruses often find their fastest transmission routes in the economically deprived urban settings that comprise many inner city uh, situations. And so we really do have to think about this when we're shown graphic evidence of issues around equity and access. Now, returning briefly to the issue of contact tracing, we know uh, the experience in the UK around the NHS COVID app, attempts to build effective contact tracing. These are difficult um, uh, challenges to overcome, and it makes us reflect on the proper balance between building effective technology on the one hand and the privacy questions on the other. This is a live debate playing out in real time as we speak. And Data won't just be about tracing, it will be about testing. Uh, just this last week, Oxford has announced that it will be trialing um, mass screening. Uh, in fact, similar announcement has gone out in the city of Liverpool. And the mass screening here is self-administered. These are swab tests, effectively, that uh, in the first instance, our students will apply, they'll self-test, and they will get a result within 30 minutes. Now, that sort of large-scale screening data and testing data is probably going to end up being one of our most powerful initial defenses against the virus, understanding where it is in the population, particularly because this is designed to pick up those asymptomatic carriers. And we know that a great deal of transmission happens with individuals who have no idea that they are infected. Now, how this plays out and how effective that will be is actually a matter of trials underway at the moment. So back to the ODI. The ODI is about trying to advance our understanding around infrastructure. What does a data infrastructure look like? It's about capability. What data literacy, what skills do people need to understand this in their daily lives, but also in the way that they can develop responses to the virus? It's about innovation. The ODI, one of its core features is about innovation. As I've already said, it's about equity. It's about understanding that data can work for everyone. And it will be many occasions, not just about the technology, it will be about the ethics. Are you using the data that you're collecting or have at your disposal ethically? What choices do we have 
uh, to make about what is collected, how it's used. And finally, it's about engagement. We want everyone to be able to take part in this extraordinary set of opportunities. And when we talk about data as infrastructure, we really do mean that analogy. It's more than analogy, it's a direct readover. When we think of infrastructures like the national grid or our road transport system, we think of concrete physical infrastructure. The digital infrastructure, the lists of where the hospitals are, what the equipment in the hospitals are, what drugs are available to treat what conditions, what we know about our various patients. These are a new class of infrastructure that has to be built, maintained and innovated on. And we published about this extensively within the ODI. We've made it one of our key features. And going forward, the other key feature we want to emphasize is the notion of data institutions. And this, we think, is going to be a very important new way of thinking about data. It's thinking that the data just doesn't have to sit with a particular large corporate platform, or it doesn't have to sit with a particular organization or group who have a specific pre-existing possibly commercial interest in it, that there may be new ways of mutualizing data, new kinds of collectives or collaboratives, cooperatives, data trusts that seek to steward data for a common purpose. And we think these will be a very interesting addition to the data ecosystem going forward. So that's a very brief uh, review of some of the major work that the Open Data Institute is doing and why we exist, why we're passionate about it. And of course, in my other roles as a professor at Oxford, we're directly concerned with developing the technology that will allow us to analyze and derive insights from the data that's collected, the AI algorithms at the back of all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Nigel. Um, that was a very fascinating journey through the history of uh, what open data can and has achieved. Um, and why it's more important than ever, I guess, to use data in a way that can unlock its uh, social opportunities, uh, particularly in the current climate that we find ourselves in. I'd like to delve a little deeper into some of the points you raised. Um, you speak about pa the pandemic and how that's really helped upend our traditional views of data and privacy. I think it's fair to say that more, more than any other time, we've become obsessed with numbers. Um, how's, has that been a positive shift, do you think, or do you get the sense that we've become a bit frustrated with data um, and how it's being used at the moment? I think it's a great question. I, th I think certainly we, we have this touching faith in data and we have to be critical and reflective. The data in and of itself says nothing about its accuracy, its origination, the various other qualities it might have. So that is one of our major challenges in developing this notion of data literacy for people to not necessarily to accept the data at face value, to ask questions about how it was collected, how accurate we think it is, how maintainable, how reliable. All of these questions, I think, are ones that should be at the forefront of our thinking. So I think that that whole issue around data literacy. And in some sense, we've all become um, uh, kind of statisticians in a way. We're all kind of poring over these things, wondering whether the, the results, the outputs of these um, data analyses are to be believed, are to be trusted. And again, I think it's a very interesting, you see this as you range across the way in which data is being applied, not just in the context of the virus, but also in the context of uh, everything from voting patterns. You know, people will see voting patterns that mispredict and somehow think that the models are wrong. I mean, often it's that the data underpinning them hasn't been appropriately collected in a representative way. Of course, it may be that the models that the data fuels also need to be closely inspected, which is why we made the, the case very powerfully for these, the whole piece to be openly available for comment, for, in some sense, all of our peer review. Many eyes on this is a very powerful antidote. Mm. It's interesting um, you mentioned data literacy. I guess um, it's also important to make sure that our policymakers and other people in general have a bit more education perhaps on um, data. Um, how do you think we can achieve this and that they have access to the right data and they know that it's correct data? 
Yeah, that, and again, uh, we have we we've, we've seen this. This is not a new problem, but the issue of what we have to have fundamentally in our educational curriculum. Um, what skills can we reasonably assume uh, a student coming out of uh, a secondary school, an FE college, a university course has got? And I think we're having to do some really um, hard thinking about this. Um, it's certainly the case that when you look at traditional areas which have not had much impact from uh, the hard sciences, that that need for data skills has become more and more apparent. Actually, if you take, again, Oxford, one of the famous examples is the PPE course, Politics, Philosophy and Economics. Actually, that was originally developed to incorporate the new science of subjects like economics into the curricula. We've got new disciplines now, you know, AI, um, data science, which have got new methods and we have to develop our own curricula. We have to develop that all the way back into schools. And there's real efforts underway, organizations like the Royal Society working to change and improve the educational curricula with, uh, with teachers in this space. And the policymakers, well, they're gonna have to be, if they don't have these skills at this point, they're gonna have to be intelligent enough customers to know where to get good insights. And it's no doubt that one of the professions of the future is of course the data analyst who will be equipped with a range of these skills. And uh, she uh, would be in a position to really help uh, develop advice and guidance. That's great. I mean, um, you talked a lot about the need for proper infrastructure to handle all, all of this data. Um, are there any best practices in other countries, perhaps, that we can look to to copy their data infrastructure over here? Well, I think in many respects, we, we have some of the elements of that here in the UK. We have great organisations that collect and manage data partly as a statutory requirement. So the Office for National Statistics is a great example. I think our um, existing organizations will play uh, an, interest, an increasingly important role as their role is expanded outwards. So you want organizations that have a traditional interest in data to have their remits expanded and extended. There'll be then questions about where the various um, data infrastructure elements I talked about are best kept and managed. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Companies House, or Company Data, Companies House, uh, a, the organization that manages and maintains this data. And the question will be, as you go across various parts of the public sector and private sector, uh, who will be the stewards and custodians of the data? Because you need people who have got a stake in and are committed to maintaining that data to the best standards. And we have that in certain areas. We have that in geospatial. We have it in the Met Office. We have it in a range of places. But the questions we've got to ask is, is how do we extend that? Because data is everywhere and there may well be the need for new organizations and new institutions to help develop and manage that data. We see it in the building and construction industry. Uh, we see it in, in various health and safety contexts. We see it in the health service, but there just needs to be a much larger effort to organize and, or, organize and orchestrate that. And that's part of the, the ambition behind the national data strategy that the government's consulting on at the moment. And it will take a serious amount of collective endeavor to do that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this this concept of data institutes is, is really interesting. And I know um, you previously mentioned there's no one size fits all approach to this. Um, but in terms of some of the governance and ethical challenges that creating these institutes might present to us, what, what might we come up against? Well, I think that's right. I don't think, by the way, there is any one single uh, model for what a data institution uh, would look like. I, I mean, it can uh, run from something as informal as a collective who decide to agree on common standards about pulling the data together. It might be more formally and legally constituted and actually have trustees who have a uh, duty and an interest in managing or maintaining the data. Um, it will need resources to keep the thing up and running and to be maintained. Uh, and so I think there'll be a lot of innovation around the different sorts of uh, institutional structure that work. And again, in the past, we've, we've done this in other contexts, cooperatives, uh, various forms of mutual society that pooled 
uh, various resources for a wider good. And I think we need to look at some of the lessons from the past, but also understand what we need to develop for the future. And we can see again, you know, in in organizations like the um, uh, uh, Wiki Foundation, the the, the uh, uh, Wiki Foundation, there's there's a whole set of uh, ideas around how for a large op open uh, source uh, resource, which everybody relies on, such as um, a Wikipedia, you know, how do you manage and ensure that the benefits of that continue to flow to the widest number of people? And again, in science, in health, we can see good exemplars where data has been pulled together and made available to a wider community. And, and, and there'll be a really interesting um, discussion to be had between the public and private interests in that space given that, for example, scientific publishing is also a lucrative um, uh, uh, commercial market as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think just to circle back to the pandemic, um, I know that many people are concerned about giving the government their data, despite the benefit that it could have with, um, you know, finding a vaccine or track and trace. Um, how do we get the public to put aside privacy concerns for now for the public good. Is there any right way to do this or how do we build up that trust? It is about trust. Um, and is there a right way to do it? If there was a complete formula, I think we'd be busy adopting it. I think different uh, nations uh, have different histories in regard of collecting data by governments that, that colour this whole response that people have. It's also as you suggest, it depends on the context of the time. I think in moments of national or global emergency, people do uh, change their expectations. You know, in, the, in, in, uh, in our country, the notion of privacy in law is around a reasonable expectation to privacy. And we collectively change our sense of what we think is admissible. Now, in the area as, such as notifiable diseases, it's always been the case that we've understood that there is a larger public health good in certain information, which would normally remain confidential to the individual being made widely available. And I think we've always uh, actually operated in a world where privacy isn't an absolute right, that there are situations in which a collective good will outweigh the individual's uh, private interests. You go right back to the example of Typhoid Mary in the US, who's, who was literally a physical carrier of typhoid and had to be put under various forms of restraint at various times to stop her transmission of that into the community. So we do understand this. We're not at that level here. Of course, in some sense, what we're trying to find is that balance point between a reasonable sharing of data. And this is happening, for example, in, in the health system right now, where Electronic patient records are being linked together to understand at large scale uh, what the progress of the disease is like, how the disease is responding to various uh, um, therapies that are being tried, what the comorbidities are, what are the susceptibilities of particular parts of the population to the disease. Now, interestingly, the model there is that the the traditional safe harbors of electronic uh, patient data or the place where the data lives. It lives behind those firewalls. And you, the modeler, you, the researcher, uh, submit your code into that safe haven and the results are run over that data and then delivered back to you. So there are all sorts of ways in which we can present models that ensure a high degree of security around the data. Certainly those all have to be explored and the benefits the pros and cons of each of those approaches, uh, approaches assessed. Okay. And then in, in terms of the way we collect and treat data, do you think um, the stakes have been raised by advances in AI technology, um, given that that uses so much data? Um, and I know countries like China have so much access to data that perhaps we don't. Do you think that risks um, the UK falling behind in, in this area? Well, the kind of data, data, data wars often gets talked about and the idea of indeed sovereign AI, that, that, that one country's AI is somehow at an advantage over others because of the data they have. <clears throat> I'm a little bit skeptical about that. I think that in, in many cases, the, um, uh, there's also sometimes an important 
counterpoint to make to all of this. Um, it's the idea that just huge amounts of data doesn't always deliver the understanding you want from it. And, and uh, I remember a lovely comment once, which was the, uh, the best form of, uh, of, of data management is a theory. So if you can actually account for your data in terms of the underlying rules that produce it, uh, that's, that's a powerful set of insights. So there are arguments back and forth about just how much data you need. Certainly modern AI methods are very data intensive indeed. And we know that they benefit from data, but also we also know they're susceptible to various biases if that data itself is not representative, or we haven't been reflective about the questions we're putting to the AI algorithm and the data we feed it. And there are many examples uh, that were becoming more apparent uh, to us all the time about where the issues around the ethical management and the actual accuracy and validity of uh, AI algorithms using data, where, where all that uh, sits. And I think there's also a, a question around uh, what the consent that we do want to provide as a society to large scale use of data to analyze our patterns of life. And again, this brings us back to the question of, in the context of the current situation, <clears throat> I think people understand that their, their shopping habits, their travel habits, they are all, uh, I think, uh, significant uh, and could be affected by the uh, by the pandemic in such a way that they would want to volunteer that data and would not have particular issues with it being used for a wider good, uh, for a wider purpose. But I think the conditions under which that data, that's the point. We have to have, a, in some sense, ways to be able to consent to the appropriate use. Where, and, and the issue is how we can get those consent methods uh, uh, established. Uh, it's not always about individual consent. It'll be about representative consent. It'll be about the fact that we understand that for these purposes, the data is being used in a, a particular way, and we're we're happy with that. In other contexts, we're, we're we're not so comfortable. And these bars, these these norms that we establish, they don't have to sit there forever and a day. You can certainly change the underlying permissions for which data might be used in particular contexts. This is not beyond the art of of regulation or management. It's something, though, that we've not really had to confront at scale before because of the sheer availability, as you say, of data and the methods and algorithms that use it. OK. Well, hopefully the, the, it's the right time now for us to accelerate everything you guys have been doing at the I, ODI. I um, was just wondering what areas are you prioritizing at the ODI in the next year? And do you feel like you've set out um, what you set out to accomplish when you set it up in 2012 has happened? Well, I think the ODI is, 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 is always work in progress. Uh, its mission still remains entirely valid uh, and, and a central one. Um, there is always more to do. I mean, the next year looking forward, we've particularly got a large program of work on looking at various types of data institution, what that might mean, where we can usefully share data, uh, what lessons we can draw from that in particular sectors. We're looking at health. Uh, we're looking at uh, mental and physical well-being. We're looking at transport. We're looking at a whole variety of areas where the idea of a data institution is really landing well with those sectors, the, the, the companies and organizations in those sectors that have this, this challenge. So that'll be certainly an area. There's an ongoing piece of work around the challenges of data literacy, and there will be continuing work around trying to help the construction and delivery of an effective data infrastructure wherever that might need to occur and where of course we're not we don't have infinite resources and what we are always looking for are partners to sit down and share our experience of what we've learned with them in potentially new sectors so we've worked in the past in agriculture, in energy. We've worked in uh, financial contexts, contexts such as open banking. We've worked in many, and, and we're always looking for new opportunities there. At the moment, our, we have, a, uh, obviously, understandably, some of our work is focusing on health. We're looking at um, uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, the whole issue there that we know there's a big problem coming over the horizon around uh bacteria and microbes developing resistance to our most effective medicines and, and and how do we use data to make sure that we can keep that resistance from overwhelming us there's a whole variety of programs of work in that for example 
Um, well, thank you very much, Sir Nigel. I feel like we've run out of time, but it was a very interesting chat and I can't wait to see what the ODI has in store and um, the partnerships you, you make in the future. So thank you.